everybody. So my name is uh, Christoph, and I'm really happy to be here at Monolith Party uh, to talk a little bit about reactive programming, uh, bananas and robots, as the presentation says. And so um, maybe a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm a professor in Ghent University, and uh, this is actually like what I teach my students uh, at university. And um, although this is in the advanced track, I don't think it's uh, all that complex. Um, and I think it's in the advanced course because it's Monday, right? I mean, if, uh, if you uh, don't know Haskell so well, I'm, I, I will talk about uh, applicatives and functors and monads, uh, but uh, I think this should, should not be that hard. And um, so what I'm, what I'm also doing in my spare time is I'm programming a dependently typed programming language which is called WebPy. So I will be running around here. If you want to hear a little bit about that, you can always come and ask me. It's what? What it's called? It's called WebPy. Uh, but I don't think you will find uh, anything <laughs> from it. OK, so but today it's going to be about robots. And before I'm, I'm going to dive into the Haskell code, I'm going to motivate a little bit uh, why we are going to do all that. And I will do it at a very uh, slow pace. Uh, because it's Monday and I googled what Monday uh, means in images and this is what uh, came up. <coughs> so, um, the, um, when you learn to program, basically what people tell you is, well, a program it's some, uh, or an application, well, it takes some input, it does some things, and then it produces some output. And that works uh, pretty well uh, for like beginner programmer exercises, but then when you go to uh, not really the real world, but a bit more the real world, you, you notice very fast that actually what an application does, it gets like a bunch of events, uh, just like a normal, any application, it gets uh, events from your keyboard, from your mouse, uh, it might do some, uh, some networking, and so it also produces a bunch of events, and so uh, this is a more accurate view of uh, how applications actually work. And um, the, uh, a very direct uh, example of this is like you have these big multi-touch tables and so you have like lots of fingers on the, this thing and so uh, what the application needs to do is it needs to process all these events, all these uh, touches that come in and then it needs to process it and show uh, things on the screen. <coughs> Uh, but also in like less obvious event-driven applications is, for example, the whole Adobe uh, suite. And so uh, there was a, a paper about this, and what uh, they basically uh, saw is that in in like uh, programs like uh, uh, Photoshop and so on, 30% of all the code is in event handling code. Yeah? And then, uh, actually worse, 50% of all the bugs that they have in their code is originated in the event handling code, which actually shows that in production code, writing this event handling, it's really difficult. Yeah. And so, um, one of the reasons why it's so difficult is because uh, the way that it's implemented. So, uh, maybe raise your hand if you know what the observer pattern is. So, that's really good. <coughs> so, uh, there is a paper uh, from uh, Martin Odersky which basically says that the observer pattern is extremely horrible. Who, who is convinced that it's horrible? So, okay. Uh, <coughs> I, I, uh, then I will still go into uh, a, um, an example. So, uh, the example that we are going to look at is uh, simply drumming with a mouse. Ah, I didn't see that you didn't raise uh, your. Uh, your, your, your hand, it seemed to me that everybody raised their hand. So uh, it's, uh, it's actually, um, so what you have is like you have a, a subject and then what you do is you can register yourself uh, to, uh, to be notified of certain things and how, the way that you do it is like you basically uh, install a callback and then every time something happens that callback will be called. Yeah, that's, that's uh, more or less what it, uh, what it does. And you have uh, diff uh, certain uh, differences depending on uh, what you try to implement so you can also notify all the observers and so on. But basically it's like you're giving callbacks, you're giving uh, something a callback and then every time, uh, every time something happens it will, uh, it will call it. Okay, so if you have uh, an application which is simply um, drawing with a mouse. So uh, you click somewhere 
and then as long as you are clicking, uh, you will draw a path. Yeah? That's uh, the application that we are looking at. If you implement uh, this, um, <coughs> then you will get something like this. So um, uh, the move observer, that's something that will be notified every time something moves. Yeah? So every time you move your, uh, your mouse, this observer will be called. Yeah? And then what you, what you basically do is you install two other observers uh, to be notified when you click down. Yeah, that's one. And uh, you also uh, install another observer when you release it. Yeah? So <coughs> what you do when you uh, click down is you're going to uh, register this moose mouse, mouse observer, this one. Yeah? And so uh, when you release it, you're going to unregister it. Yeah? And then every time, uh, so you click, and uh, then you install the mouse down observe, uh, you, the move observer, and then every time you are moving, this one is going to be called. And so what it's going to do is, it's going to create a new path to the point where it has been moving. So uh, this is uh, called with a certain event, and from that event you get it, its position and you draw the path. The, the, the real details are not so important, uh, the, but uh, the observation is, that uh, you want to implement one feature, namely drawing a line. And so um, you, you actually see that uh, the functionality of implementing this is being split over, two, uh, over these two, actually over these three callbacks. Yeah? And so what's also uh, bad about this is by uh, the way that these observers work is that you are actually having this path uh, in a lexical scope so that they are um, accessible from all the observers that need to uh, access it. So that's actually uh, quite bad. And then the last uh, thing is that the control flow of the application, yeah, it's no longer dictated by your source code. Yeah? So uh, every uh, observer here uh, uh, is actually an entry point in your application. So instead of just having uh, like one uh, easy sequential program, you're actually putting like places uh, in your code where, uh, where every time you get an event where you're going to jump to, yeah? which makes it difficult to reason about this. Yeah? Is this like sufficiently uh, clear for everybody? Uh, the, the details of uh, how the code works is not so important, just that uh, if you make use of all these callbacks, your code becomes complex. That should be the message uh, that, you, that you get from, from this part. Okay. <coughs> so uh, one, of the, um, one of the solutions to, um, to uh, this problem uh, is what they call functional reactive programming. And so who has already heard about functional reactive programming? So everybody. <laughs> so, uh, so who knows how to implement it? <laughs> okay, that's uh, otherwise I could basically stop, right? <laughs> okay, so um, functional reactive programming, it's actually taking the ID of like a, a spreadsheet. And so uh, in a spreadsheet, uh, what you can do is basically you can uh, write uh, certain things and uh, what, what's going to happen is that every time the, uh, something changes, then uh, it's going to be updated. And so for example, this is like a field where you show the time and just uh, every time that the, the, um, the time has changed, you basically just update it. And you can have this uh, over other cells, so when, whenever you change one cell, all the rest of the uh, things will also change. Yeah? So it will react to the change and everything will be, um, will be recomputed just by changing one value. And so the, the idea of reactive programming is to take this ID and put it in a programming language. <coughs> so the whole essence uh, is, is basically on this slide. So this is a super important slide. So um, in the two uh, basic abstractions of functional reactive programming are behaviors and events. So we are going to start with behaviors. And so um, a behavior, it's simply a function uh, that will vary uh, depending on the time. Yeah? So it's a time varying function, so it's parameterized by the time. So every time uh, the time changes, it will produce you uh, a new value. Yeah? 
And then we have events, and these are uh, discrete things. So you can represent them by uh, an array uh, of tuples, where uh, the first element is a time, and then the second is a value. Yeah. <coughs> so if you, um, if you have this kind of model, you can, for example, have a behavior of seconds. And so if you have a seconds behavior, uh, it, it's basically a function that at, at, at every point in time it's going to produce an integer, namely the amount of seconds that has passed since you start the application. Yeah? And so then you have print seconds and uh, this is going to do some I.O. So uh, basically what we do is we just map over seconds and we are going to just show the time. Yeah? And then when you, uh, when you run this behavior, uh, print seconds, it's simply going to show you uh, the time. So, <coughs> so basically, this is like um, the, the same program. And so when you execute it, it's just going to show you, um, is this feasible? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe I can uh, change the font size a bit. So, but here, uh, what's what's running here is basically the uh, the seconds, and they are just being printed out. So this is, of course, a very easy program. Uh, but there are uh, uh, a few things to notice about here. <coughs> so uh, the first thing is uh, basically uh, you have these uh, seconds. You don't really, uh, so the most important part to see is that you don't have a loop, yeah? There is no loop. So basically what you're just saying like, okay, this is uh, my new behavior, and it's just going to produce some I.O., and then when you, when you run it, it's going to uh, be recomputed every time seconds has changed. And uh, in our case, what it's going to do is it's going to print something, yeah? <coughs> Okay, so what we are going to do now is we are going to start from the basic ID of these behaviors and events, and we are going to build a library uh, which uh, allows us to write this kind of things. And so this uh, functional reactive programming has been adopted in lot of, lots of web frameworks um, and also in Java and so on. <coughs> so the first thing that we are going to start with uh, Maybe very important to say, we are going to look at the theoretical model of how you could implement this, and actually you can implement it like this, but it's uh, very inefficient. Yeah? This is not the way that, uh, that you want to implement this for, uh, for a production system. This is simply uh, a way of explaining you how the basic constructs work and how you can combine uh, these things. Okay? So we, we are going to start with time. And so uh, what we see here is we are just going to represent time as a float. And so it just uh, it starts at zero and it just expands and it's become bigger and bigger. That's uh, how we are going to represent time. And so uh, a behavior, well, if you represent it in a graph, then you, uh, it's going to have, uh, it's going to, it's a time varying value. And so for each point in time, it's going to have a certain value. And so, <coughs> the way that we represent this is by a new data uh, type. It has one uh, uh, parameter, A, and so uh, we use record syntax. So we can run it, and if you give it some time, it's going to give you back an A for every point in time. Yeah? Clear enough? Okay, so <coughs> the first observation is that if you have uh, this behavior, that you can actually uh, implement uh, the functor. And you can make it an instance of fun. So, um, <coughs> okay, I, will, I already showed it. So we are just going to implement fmap. So you have some function f, and you have some behavior g. So what are you going to do? Well, you are going to create a new behavior where you are simply going to apply uh, this uh, function f after you have applied g. Yeah? So, um, but remember that 
this whole thing, it's, uh, it's, it's expecting some time. So what's going to happen is you're going to apply time to the first function g. Yeah? That's going to produce some kind of value that you're then going to pass on to f. And that's uh, basically how uh, your behavior is a function. <coughs> it's also applicative. Um, so if you have uh, a pure of A, how would you implement um, how would you implement a behavior? Constraint function. What? Use the constraint function. Like, make a constraint function or whatever. I have a constraint function. Constraint function. Constraint function. Constant. Like, no matter what time is always produce A. Yeah, exactly. So you're just going to make a new behavior and uh, the time itself doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so you're just going to give back A. The other one is a, a little bit more, uh, well, it's not super complex, but it's a little bit more complex. So if you have a behavior, bf here, it's a function that will receive some time and it's going to produce some value. And then uh, we will have a, um, <coughs> so this is going to um, take, uh, actually this behavior, it's like a, a time varying function. Yeah? So this bf, it's going to produce a new function at every moment in time. That's, that's what's going to happen. And so um, here we have a time varying uh, value, b a. So what we are going to do is we are first going to get a value uh, by supplying the current time to this behavior. This is going to produce some kind of value. And so th this is uh, the function. This is a time for variety. This whole thing is a time varying function. So we apply the time to it and we get a function. And then um, we are going to pass this value that we get here. Clear for everybody? Okay. So that's super good. So <coughs> then uh, we are going to look at events. So events, um, if you represent them in, uh, in a graph, they are basically points. Yeah? So you have, uh, for some uh, certain time, you get a value, but you don't get it at every point in time, uh, like with a behavior. You only, it's discrete, you only have at certain points in time, you have an associated value with it. Okay. So you can implement a, a, a functor for this. <coughs> How would you do this? So uh, you can just map over it, and so here you have a, a function, and so every element in this um, every element in this list is a, a, a tuple which has a certain time and a value. So what you basically do is you don't touch uh, the time, but you just apply the function to each of these values, and then uh, for, of course you need to map over something over this list. Okay, so then you you get a. Function. So this is one way of writing it, but uh, basically in the in the Haskell library, uh, this is already a functor. So um, <coughs> you can just map over it, and then you can get uh, a simpler implementation. You can just do f map, and then you do that over the uh, over the whole list. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so this uh, leads us to this overview. So basically, what we started from is, is really the principles. Yeah? We, we have seen a behavior. It's a time varying function. And events, they are, um, they are discrete point in, points in time. They just have some time and an associated value. Okay? And then we have uh, seen that uh, they have properties that we know from, uh, from functional programming. So a behavior is both functor, a functor and an applicative. And an event is uh, a functor. Okay, but th this still doesn't give you like a good way of combining all these uh, different things. So now we are going to look like uh, if you if you have these kind of things, how you can actually start building applications. In this. <coughs> so never, uh, it's a very simple kind of uh, event. Well, it's just uh, uh, an event which has the empty list. Yeah. And so uh, we can then start doing certain things. We can start filtering events. So if we have uh, a boolean, then we can just filter over the whole list. Yeah. 
I think this is uh, quite uh, self-explanatory. Okay, so <coughs> if we have two events, yeah, we can start uh, combining them. And so there is a uh, in the, in most uh, libraries there is some function called union with, which uh, basically takes a function that takes two a's and produces a new a. Yeah? And then it takes two events of a. So in this in this case, this union with what it's going to do is basically either uh, things uh, happen at exactly the same time or they don't. Yeah? So in this case. If we uh, if we put these two things on each other, then uh, we see that these two events uh, have exactly the same time. I put them a little bit apart because otherwise we don't see it. Uh, but uh, these ones they happen exactly at the same time. And then you have two other uh, events, and they uh, they didn't happen at the same time, and they are just uh, copied. Uh, so you take basically the union uh, of uh, all the events, and where they are at exactly the same time. We are going to use this function to produce a new value. So that's what a union with <coughs> does. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. Does that mean that in a list of events you can never have uh, two events happening at exactly the same time? Is that an invariant or interesting? Yes. All right. So um, in, in one event list, uh, two, um, two, two uh, values shouldn't have exactly the same uh, time. But uh, this implementation doesn't uh, actually enforce th yeah. forces this. And I'm not sure whether um, the, the, the libraries actually enforce this. But it's, it's kind of implicit that this uh, doesn't happen for one, one thing. <coughs> so, uh, how to implement this union bit? Well, we get this function f, which can combine uh, two a's and produce a new a. And so, we it's basically is simply make a, a new helper function uh, combine, which takes uh, this f and two lists. And so, <coughs> if, uh, if one of the lists is uh, already empty, we just give back the other list. That's uh, the, fir the first two things. And then, uh, if uh, they are both still not empty and they have exactly the same time, you're, uh, <coughs> you're going to uh, apply the function and otherwise you're simply going to advance uh, one of them. Um, so in case that T1 is smaller than T2, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, leave uh, T1 here and you're going to jump to the next value. So we're assuming that the original list was sorted in 10. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess this is, is this how it's actually implemented? Like, or this is this like for just for illustration? Well, this this is for uh, illustration because um, the, uh, the, these events in your application they just happen, right? You don't uh, at the start of your program you don't know when they are going to happen. Yeah. So th th this is um, uh, this is like a mental model. Yeah. So. Uh, in, in, in a certain sense, all the events that you're going to do with your mouse, they're like an infinite stream of, uh, of, uh, of these events. But uh, at the start of your application, you cannot predict when uh, the user is going to click exactly. Right? But uh, the, uh, the, uh, the idea is that you have these kind of lists. Yeah? And then the, the union with operator, it's going to do exactly this. So it's going to look at two uh, kind of events. You don't know when they are going to uh, exactly happen at the start of the program, but you can think of, about them as an infinite list of, uh, of pairs. And so um, the second thing that we are going to look at is uh, what's called stepper. Stepper it's, uh, takes an initial A, uh, it takes an event, and it takes a behavior of A. And so um, what's going to happen is basically that we are going to transform, um, I'm sorry, it returns a behavior. So uh, what's going to happen is that we are going to transform this event into a behavior. Yeah? And so the difference, of course, is that an event, it only exists at certain parts uh, in time. 
uh, at certain points in time, while a behavior, it exists at every point in time. So uh, the, the stepper function, basically, it's what it's going to do. It's, it's going to start with this initial A value. Yeah, that's going to be the, uh, the initial value. And then every time there is an, um, there is an event, it's going to hold this uh, value until there is a new event. Yeah, and, that's, and then usually you get like these kind of steps. And that's also uh, why it's called the stepper function. <coughs> so the implementation, um, it's, uh, uh, it's on this slide. So, <coughs> maybe, um, <coughs> so the, um, the observation is basically that you, uh, that uh, in order to find which value in time uh, it should have, is you actually have to look at the value which uh, at the, uh, well, actually at this point, you need to, if you are at this time, yeah, you need to look at the first uh, point in the event uh, which is smaller than uh, the, the current time that you're at. Yeah? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So uh, you need to look at the previous uh, point in time uh, where the event had a value. And so at this, uh, at this time, you need to find uh, this one. And at this time, you need to find this one. Yeah, you, you, you basically always have to go and find uh, the one which is just, just one smaller than the time that you're at that moment at. So what about the zero position? Well, the zero position, that's why you supply this initial A value. So at this point, it's going to have value A, and then at all the other points, you have to <coughs> find the one which is just one smaller. So yeah. that's the way of you taking the set time and making it continuous? Well, um, the, the reason to do that is because uh, sometimes you have, uh, you, it, sometimes it's easier to, to reason about um, uh, well, for example, uh, let, let's look at this. If you have uh, an event, and so just imagine that you want to apply some function uh, which is uh, represented by, uh, by these events. Yeah? So for example, you would say like, uh, this is uh, set, uh, set my screen to green, and this is set my screen to, to red. I'm just saying something. So these points, these, they are just values, so they could also be uh, functions, right? Uh, and so if you would only have something like this, yeah, uh, at all these diff times in between, you, you wouldn't know what to do with it. Yeah? So, but if you transform it into a behavior, you can simply uh, find the function, and so you're going to set green until uh, you find uh, another uh, point in time. <coughs> Yeah. So that's, that's one of the reasons why you would want to convert some event into a behavior. Simply because uh, you want to have a value at every point in time. For certain <coughs> okay. So we were looking at this. Uh, so um, this drop until, um, what it's basically going to do, well, it's going to uh, basically look at the second time. Yeah? And it's just going to... Um, <coughs> so if um, so, T one, you can think about T one. It's the time where we want to find uh, the the value for. Uh, so T one, and then we have this list, uh, which is um, uh, which is uh, uh, a list uh, of time value uh, functions. And so you have um, you need to look at the second element in this list, and so you need to give back. Uh, the first one. So if T2 is bigger or equal than T1, um, <coughs> then you want to give back this one. Yeah? And so uh, otherwise you want to um, uh, drop. Yeah, you want to recursively go to the next one until uh, T2 is bigger or equal. And so if these two things uh, uh, never happen, that basically means that this T1, uh, that it's bigger than all the things in the list. And so you just give back, um, what do you give back the list? Uh, hmm. Let's change. 
Then, then in each it's an empty list and you just need that uh, <coughs> and so basically what you do is um, you are going to uh, drop until this t then uh, the first value it's going to be exact uh, going to have the value that you want and that one is what you uh, so that's basically what <coughs> then you also have uh, so if you want to combine behaviors and events you have something which uh, looks very similar uh, to applicative. So you have a behavior of functions and you have an event uh, of A. Yeah? So what you basically are going to do is you are going to, <coughs> you're going to map um, uh, this, um, this function that just takes a T and A and it's basically going to apply uh, the behavior at that point, uh, moment in time uh, to this uh, A. Yeah, so again, this is a behavior B. So it's a time varying, um, uh, it's a time varying function, this thing. This whole thing is something from A to B. And so uh, what you do is you uh, supply it with the current time, yeah, and then you give it an A. Yeah? And then uh, it's going to apply uh, the function that this behavior has at uh, this moment in time. Yeah? Okay, so you also have uh, something which is actually going to simply forget <coughs> about, uh, about the event. So here you have a behavior B, you have some event A, and so what you are basically going to do is you're just going to replace um, the you're basically going to replace the value that the event had at a certain point in time by applying uh, this behavior at that point in time yeah <coughs> so uh, this last one seems a little bit strange because you're just uh, you're not really uh, doing anything with the original value of, of this uh, of this event and so um, if you look at uh, this slide uh, we have some behavior and we have uh, events which uh, basically are these tuples uh, where uh, you have some time and a certain value. And so basically what you are going to do with this, um, with this operator is you are going to uh, actually preserve the, um, the structure of this uh, event. So this is uh, very <coughs> frequent at, at a certain time intervals and you are basically simply going to chop up this behavior uh, in this, uh, by, by uh, using the timings of this event. Yeah? And so you will get something like this. <coughs> okay. um, is everything clear till now? Okay, very good. So let's go back to our mini example. So uh, in this case we had seconds uh, and basically now we have a much better understanding what these behaviors are and so on, uh, but uh, I left out one big uh, thing, this run B, uh, what is it actually doing, right? So, um, but uh, now that we have looked at this, maybe uh, somebody can, can answer. So run B, what is, what, what is it going to do? It was constructor in this behavior database. It was uh, a record. It no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I see. I see the confusion. Uh, the confusion. Uh, behavior. It has. Uh, it. Uh, it has one field, and it's called run. Yeah. It's not. It's not called run b. So run b is a function that is going to do something. And so um, we all. Runs it runs with I/O. Yes. So it's going to do this I/O thing. So it provides it a stream of time and then. Yes, exactly. So um, here we have like this behavior thing, and uh, at every point in time, it's going to give you some I/O. Yeah. So this run B is actually uh, the loop didn't go away. Yeah. The loop is just hidden now in this run B. Yeah. Is everybody following what I'm saying? So um, we have this behavior uh, of I.O. And so that uh, simply means that if you give it a certain time, uh, it's going to produce you some I.O. Yeah? And so if you, uh, if you call it every second yeah, with, uh, with a current 
uh, second, then it's simply going to uh, evaluate it. So in this uh, 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 way, this is one of the ways that you can implement it. <coughs> so you just uh, create an infinite list of timings, which starts at, at zero, and then uh, you basically are just going to wait, and then uh, you uh, map m over uh, this. Uh, you map m this function over your infinite list. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Is everybody fine with uh, with uh, map m and so on? You, you can. I don't see. <laughs> Last times I I asked, uh, there was like an overwhelming reaction, but not. Uh, what? They are being sequenced. They are being sequenced. Yeah, so they are just being uh, sequentialized. So this is... Uh, um, so what is weight doing? So weight is defined here. So uh, thread delay uh, seconds is going to produce some I.O. that is, uh, that is uh, going to basically wait a second. And then so... Uh, I forgot the name. This is like uh, bind, but you don't need uh, the... Um, and so uh, what you do is this S, yeah. <coughs> this S is the behavior which is uh, if you produce, uh, if you give it some time. So here we have all the timings. Uh, so what we are going to do is one by one we are going to give zero, one, and so on. And so this S is going to be some I/O thing. And so what we are going to do is we are going to. Uh, do the I/O thing, and then we are going to do the uh, thread delay seconds. Yeah, and then we are going to map this <coughs> over this whole thing, and we are going to throw away the result. Yes. Uh, I'm confused. The previously, time was a float, right? Uh, or did uh, I <coughs> well, yes. It looks like it's discrete now. Uh, yes, in this in this case, uh, well, basically that's because uh, I was a bit. Uh, Didactical, I will say it like this, uh, in uh, in implementing the model. So in, in a real implementation, whenever uh, you do an update and uh, uh, the end result doesn't change uh, in the internal implementation, you are going to check whether the value has changed. And if the value doesn't change, you are not going to um, to propagate this. So uh, let me make this a little bit um, more concrete. So if you have seconds here uh, and you produce some I/O here. Uh, so, in, in theory, you're just going to do that uh, yeah, an infinite amount of time and you're going to supply floats here. And so every time uh, that this uh, gets computed and gives you the same result, you're not going to execute the I.O. That, that, that's what's happening in a real implementation. Uh, in my implementation, uh, <coughs> the implementation that you just saw, uh, you execute it every time. And so that's why I, I only supply it uh, the seconds, and then you get the expected behavior. Right. And, uh, how do you uh, avoid fuzzy weighting, basically the same stuff as we saw? Uh, if you pass in, uh, how do you know when to... Uh, do, do you continually supply floats and then check if the result is the same until it changes, or is there some kind of... Well, um, basically, if you, uh, if you have... Um, an event seconds in an, in a real implementation, you're actually just going to call it every second. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, of course, you cannot do that with button clicks and so on. These ones, you just feed them into your model as soon as they happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, in in the real model, all the timings fall uh, all the time time that uh, all the timings the, so the T's that we have seen in a real implementation, they all fall away. Uh, to have like the mental model. <coughs> okay, so um, this this is basically concluding like the mental model, and now we are going to uh, see one uh, thing which is uh, quite important to understand about uh, uh, about uh, real implementations, what they need to do in order to make this work. So um, just imagine that uh, so the dependency graph of the application that we saw was uh, uh, pretty simple. You have seconds and basically uh, put string line uh, depends on seconds. Yeah? So this is going to feed in to put string line. Yeah? So imagine that we had another uh, program 
and uh, here it basically says uh, t is bigger than um, seconds, and uh, we define t to be uh, seconds plus one. Yeah. So uh, seconds now uh, implicitly, if you look at the dependency graph, uh, this value should be updated every time that seconds changes or when uh, t changes. Yeah. So this is a very naive construction, uh, but. Uh, if you just look at, uh, at, uh, uh, at the expressions in here, uh, that's basically what, uh, uh, and th that should be a capital. Can, can you explain what this one? <coughs> what? Can you explain this one second? So uh, we have a program, and uh, we define t to be seconds plus one. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, we uh, write uh, t equals bigger than seconds. This should be a capital. So in this case, because t is seconds plus one, yeah, and uh, this is just seconds, in uh, what you would expect that this is always going to give you back true, right? This should always evaluate to true. So, but uh, if you do, uh, propagate your updates wrongly, so you see seconds has changed, and so what uh, if you would immediately <coughs> recompute this? Yeah? Then you would have uh, basically, so seconds, it becomes uh, seconds plus one, it just goes up one. So then you have seconds, and this is t, which is still uh, having the old value. Yeah? And then you would get false. <coughs> so that, uh, that problem, that you really need to look at the dependency uh, graph and update it in the correct order, uh, is uh, what they call a glitch. Yeah? So it's a uh, you, if you read literature, literature about this, uh, then you will see that uh, they sometimes talk about glitches. Well, that's that problem. And all decent implementations solve this problem, but uh, at least now you know what they, what they mean. So it's, uh, it's like, a, <coughs> it's like a, a timing problem, right? Here, if you uh, update seconds, then this seconds is living in another time than uh, this one. And that's why they also sometimes call it uh, a time leak. Okay. So, <coughs> as in the program is not syncing up with the real time currently. Uh, well, with, with, with a me mo uh, mental uh, timing, right? So here you have seconds. Yeah, you 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 increment its time. It becomes like the next second. So let, let's uh, take a complete example. So this is zero. <coughs> then you update this. It becomes one. Yeah. And so you just uh, look at this uh, uh, zero. Uh, well, one is bigger than uh, zero, yeah? And so, then you go to the next one, this becomes one, yeah? But this is living at the next time, right? And so you're going to, uh, if you would immediately update this, uh, uh, this, this expression, you would actually be combining uh, these uh, seconds which is living in a different time than this t. Okay. Yeah? Make sense? So what is the point that you're trying to make? Well, that uh, if you uh, if you if you are updating like this dependency graph, you have to do it in the correct order, not to combine uh, expressions which live in different times, okay. because then then you could get into these kind of uh, things where uh, this expression should always be true, but because of you because you have like this time glitch, it could become false. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but uh, as I said, uh, all decent implementations of reactive programming make sure that uh, you don't have these kind of glitches in your program. <coughs> okay. So, how how am I doing for time? It's five thirty-five. It's four thirty-five. So that means I still have how long? Uh, still fifteen minutes, right? Exactly. Twenty-five minutes. Okay. <coughs> so uh, the active banana, uh, basically uh, what you're uh, doing, uh, if you're programming uh, a reactive program, you're basically a plumber. Yeah? So you're going to build this kind of dependency graph, uh, uh, and that's, you're going to put these pipes together, and um, the, at, the, uh, at the very top, there's going to be these event sources which uh, are going to percolate, and then uh, you're going to produce some uh, some values at the end. And so uh, you need to basically do two things: you need to construct this dependency graph, and then you need to start feeding uh, events in this uh, dependency graph. 
So um, we are going to look at a very small example, uh, which is uh, basically animating a clock. Um, so <coughs> very, very fast. Um, I'm going to make use of a graphics library, which is called uh, Gloss. And so um, in this case, here is all the code in order to create a window. So what's important for, uh, for the presentation is that there is like this uh, funky <laughs> circle, circle solid. Uh, you give it a certain size, and it's going to um, create for you uh, something of type picture. <coughs> yeah? And so uh, if you run this uh, display, you create a new window. You say that the window is white, and this is the picture that you want to depict. And so the result is here, uh, a nice window where you have a circle uh, which has uh, size 80. Yeah? Is this library uh, for be friendly or just? No, it's, uh, it's, it's not, but, uh, but I made it uh, FRP friendly. <coughs> So um, then what, uh, what are we going to do in order to make our clock? Of course, we will need uh, like the clock face, and uh, we also need the clock hands. And so <coughs> we make a new data type. Uh, so what we supply is uh, the size, the which color it is, and a certain angle. And so um, <coughs> in order to then depict it, uh, well, you're going to make uh, the clock face, which is exactly as I uh, said before. So this is going to produce like this picture. And uh, what we also do is we are saying like, well, uh, make it a blue one. Yeah. And so uh, to make a, a clock hand, what you need to do is basically you need to uh, calculate where the endpoint is going to be. You start at zero, zero. Um, so this is center. Uh, in the implementation, it's defined to be zero, 00, and you just need to find the endpoint. And so, uh, what you're going to do is, if in order to render a clock, which takes a number of uh, clock hands, uh, what you are going to do is you're going to map over these uh, hands to render them, and um, you're going to. Uh, this is going to produce a list of of pictures. Yeah, you uh, cons the clock face to the, at the in front, and then uh, you wrap them in pictures. And these pictures they can be uh, also drawn uh, easily by the library. So I'm going a little bit fast, maybe, but uh, is everybody following? Okay. So we are just uh, um, creating this uh, clock to the Okay. So <coughs> now. In order to construct our reactive network, what do we do? Well, uh, we have created uh, a window which I will show you later. You get uh, the seconds event. Uh, this is uh, second. And then what we are going to do is we have these seconds, uh, which, is, uh, which is a functor. And so what we can do is, well, we can uh, basically uh, uh, run over it and then uh, uh, put it into a single part. Okay, I'm going to explain this more in detail. <coughs> so this is uh, the dead seconds. So it's like a reactive window, uh, and it's going to give you back an event of integers. So that's what, uh, what the seconds uh, is giving. And so here I have illustrated what uh, what this code, this S clock hand, uh, does over time. So seconds is basically just uh, zero, one, and so on. And then. Uh, what I did is, like this convert 60 from integral, it's going to take these seconds and it's going to convert it so that uh, we make one tour of the, um, of the whole clock in, uh, in 60 uh, pieces. And then, of course, what we need to do is we need to uh, convert it into a clock hand. And in this case, it's a red clock hand. So what we get here is like we have this clock and uh, we take the current second and we are going to convert it so that we know which angle there is at every second. And then uh, what we do is uh, we wrap it in a single list. So remember that, uh, that, we, that our uh, function to draw uh, these things, uh, it uh, took render clock. Well, it took a list of hands because uh, in the first example, we are just going to use one uh, hand, but uh, in the second example, we're also going to show the hour. Okay, so that's what's going on here. And then uh, what we do is, <coughs> uh, so we have the clock hand, 
uh, we render the clock and then we are going to draw the picture uh, of this uh, window and then basically what we are going to say is well reactivate it which is basically uh, taking an event uh, of IO and converting it in a moment IO. So this moment IO that's where the uh, uh, that's like uh, the, uh, our network that we are in. Okay, so let's uh, let's have a quick look. So what is reactimate again? Can you say what is reactimate again? So reactimate. So <coughs> it takes uh, an event of IOs, yeah, and it uh, gives back a moment IO, and that's uh, important here. Because uh, here we are actually in the moment I/O, which is uh, the uh, which is a monad where we can build this um, where we can build this uh, this network, yeah. And so if we have uh, an event which is producing I/Os, this reactimate is basically going to convert it into a moment I/O, which will execute the I/O as soon as uh, it becomes available. <coughs> So basically, that's the, the whole code so that we that we saw, and then uh, if we uh, compile it, clock one, then we are basically going to see this clock, and because we only have one handle, uh, it's basically just going to like uh, show uh, how this handle is moving at every point in time. <coughs> This one. <coughs> so um, what we can easily do now is we can create a second uh, clock hand and instead of um, uh, letting it move in uh, 60 uh, uh, things we move it uh, like for the for the hours <coughs> and then uh, we get something like this. So now we have two. Um, now we have two clock handles, and this one is going to move for every hour. But of course, that's a bit difficult to uh, to see because then we should wait an hour. <coughs> so um, I'm going to continue here. So um, the the trick that we are going to do here is. Um, we are going to now add a keyboard to our application. And what uh, the keyboard is going to do is basically uh, going to uh, listen uh, to, all the, um, to all the keys, of course. So we can uh, ask from our reactive window <coughs> to get uh, an event of all the keys. And so whatever you press, it will be uh, on this timeline. So but uh, what we then can do is we can filter out uh, every time that you press uh, the H key, and so instead of uh, having all, everything where the user is pressing, we are going to only have this kind of uh, event. <coughs> and then what we do is, well, we are going to um, basically forget about the actual value that it's H, and we are going to install a function which is basically uh, going to add, uh, which is going to do plus one. And then we are going to uh, call a function, accumulate uh, E, and so basically uh, it starts with zero, and it's going to actually do a fold. So it's going to start with zero, and it's going to apply this uh, function to what we already had, and that's going to become one. And then in the next uh, time, what we are going to do, we are going to use one, we are going to apply the next function, plus one, and that's going to uh, be two, and so on. And so like this, we can actually, uh, times h is going to be an event which at every point in time is going to have the amount of times that we have pressed the h key. Yeah? So, <coughs> what is plus one of people? It's acting on what? So, it's going to, so accumulate here, that's uh, uh, some kind of fault. Yeah? So, you're going to start with zero, and then you're going to use this value zero um, to give uh, to to this uh, uh, to the uh, to the next event 
yeah, which is a function, uh, which is waiting for one value, and in this case, it's zero, and so it's going to do zero plus one. That gives you one. And then uh, for the next event, it's going to use the previous value that you produced here. So that's going to be one plus one, and it's going to give you two. Yeah? Okay. <coughs> so you can do uh, the same for uh, hub key B, uh, which, uh, I know, so um, this ta uh, times H is basically going to count how many times that you have uh, pressed uh, times. <coughs> do I have some? Uh, um, Uh, and so what we what what I do here is I create it into uh, I use this stepper function. Remember, so here we have like this event, and so um, at every point in time, I actually want to know uh, how many times that I have pressed uh, H. So this needs to be one 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 two 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 and so on. And so that's basically what I'm doing here. I'm uh, converting it into a behavior. And so if you do that, you will get. It's a, it's a bit small, but every time you press uh, H now, uh, you see like the, the hour handle, which is going to uh, to jump. Okay. Uh, so I'm actually running out of time. Uh, so uh, I know that these are really bad graphics, uh, but you can also uh, do this nicer. Have like um, have like a, a bit of, uh, a bit better animations. So I will just. Let me show you the implementation in detail. But uh, for example, um, here you can then just uh, have something like this, and uh, it all works nicely. I will give you all the code, so then you can uh, play with it. Um, and so if you have fly, I also have a version that uh, I fly. <coughs> That you actually make it move, and then you can also make it uh, make it die, and you can make it uh, come back to to life and so. <coughs> okay, so um, robots. So uh, all this you can you can also apply it uh, to to program some robots. Uh, I actually wrote the library. Uh, to, to connect as well to this robot. So this robot, it has a distance sensor, it has LEDs, it has some motors and so on. And here you also can look at uh, the floor to follow a line and so on. And so basically what I, uh, what I wrote is a, a small library, uh, which in Haskell lets you communicate with, um, uh, with, uh, with this robot. So in this case, what you do is uh, you open an m -bot, you get a device, and then you can uh, basically send it commands. Yeah? Uh, and then in this case, you can, for example, uh, change uh, the LEDs, uh, which are on top. And then uh, at the end, you need to close it, and that's, uh, that's basically it. <coughs> but of course, uh, you can also do this in a reactive way. So I wrote a small reactive library, uh, which uh, connects reactive banana to the, uh, to the library uh, to the mbot library. And so in this case, uh, what do we do? Well, um, <coughs> we, make, uh, we make a new mbot, and then what we can do is, well, um, <coughs> detect uh, distance. Uh, it's basically going to take this mbot and it's going to uh, get you back uh, an event, uh, which are the distances. And in this case, what we uh, what we are going to do is well, we are going to execute some I/O, uh, namely setting the lights of this uh, M bolt. And so, what we do is uh, to set the lights, we are going to look. Uh, we, we get the M bolt and the distance. Yeah? And if the distance is bigger than uh, 30, well, we are going to put uh, its left uh, its left light on green, and otherwise, we are going to put the left light on blue. Yeah, so if it's too close, it's going to be blue, and otherwise it's going to be 
me. So if we do that. So it's the distance from what? Uh, so there is, uh, there is a, a distance sensor here. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it is, so it's the distance from some wall or something. What? It's the distance from some wall, from some obstacle. So th th this is a distance sensor. And so if you put an object in front of the, uh, the robot, it can detect in centimeters how far it is from the sensor. Okay. Yeah. execute uh, the, the, the program as it's written here. So uh, what I also do in this, uh, in this program, it's uh, uh, if, the, um, if the distance is less than 30, uh, I'm going to, no, if it's bigger than 30, I'm going to go forward, and otherwise I will turn left. So uh, this, also, this uh, should make that the robot is going to drive forward until it meets a, an object, and then it's going to turn left. This case. So now it's also showing the line green. And so if you go in front, um, I will maybe show it here. So it's just going to go forward, and then when you go in front, uh, it's going to turn left to avoid uh, hitting the wall. Okay. If you want to play around with this uh, later this week, uh, you I will be running around and you can... <coughs> so I think the, the most important thing here is that uh, you are basically... Uh, the, I, I think the, the thing to catch is uh, with these uh, behaviors and events, you are basically just uh, making like these tubes. You are just putting them together. Every time uh, one of these things changes, like every time the distance changes, you are going to re uh, recompute this whole thing. And this, uh, this gives you that the program text, we can just look at the program text and know in which order things are going to happen, which is not possible if you program this with all these callbacks. And that's uh, the strength of this thing. It, it also has a lot of weaknesses, uh, but uh, this is actually uh, why it's being used for. Yeah? So if there is, if it is, uh if there is an obstacle before certain distance, it changes its direction, right? It changes to left or right, correct? If, yes. What if happens if all the sides we have are some obstacle? Well, then it will crash because uh, it's a very simple, it's okay. a very simple uh, implementation. It will just keep going left. It will okay. just keep going left. That's okay. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you learned something.